Hello, my name is Matthew Davis. Uh, today I'm going to be talking about soil management for dry farm tomato production. Uh, I was lucky to work on this project with Brad Rimsey, an OSU student, Amy Garrett from Small Farms, Alex Stone, the OSU vegetable production specialist, and Andy Gallagher of Red Hill Soils. This project was funded by the University Corporation for Atmospheric Research uh, in 2020 and will be funded by Western SARE in 2021. Our goals for this experiment were to look at different soil management techniques, whether that is um, floor management or uh, amendment treatments to determine their effect on dry farming. First, we wanted to determine if any of these treatments reduced soil moisture losses throughout the season. An example would be, you know, leaf mulch. Would a leaf mulch or a deep mulch um, reduce water losses to evaporation? And we um, used watermark sensors to look at changes in soil water potential to determine that. We also wanted to determine if any of these treatments um, improved crop yield and quality. And then finally, we were interested in determining if these treatments affected blossom end rot in tomatoes. Um, blossom end rot is a physiological disorder that affects tomatoes. Um, you know, it can affect up to 50% of early girl tomatoes in the Willamette Valley um, on exposed sites. So definitely a big issue here um, and one that we thought maybe we could address with uh, soil amendments. Here is our experiment. Um, the experiment was a replicated trial at the OSU Vegetable Research Farm. Uh, the experimental design was a randomized complete block design. So there were four blocks. Here's one of them right here. There's the second one, the third one, and the fourth one. And if you look inside these blocks, you'll see that all the different treatments, so we had eight different treatments, were replicated within each block. So this is the leaf mulch treatment. You can see one, two, three, four. There were 32 plots total and 672 plants in the experiment. The crop was early girl tomato, um, a common dry farm tomato crop uh, that's very susceptible to blossom end rot. And the site was exposed, so there was a wind coming in from the north, and it was a shehalis silty clay loam with 12 inches of available water holding capacity in the first five feet. So it's probably one of the best soils for dry farming in the Willamette Valley. And you can see here is one of those plots um, there are 21 plants in each plot. The 16 plants around the rim are the border plants, and then the five plants in the center of the plot are the experimental plants, uh, which we actually use to take data. And here are the treatments. Um, you can see this table here, we have treatment, and you can see it's broken up by amendment treatments and floor management treatments. So for our treatments, we have control, compost, gypsum, high nitrogen, low nitrogen. These are the different amendments. And you can see that they differ in what was applied. So here for compost, you can see that the compost treatment received 60 tons of compost per acre, while the other treatments received only 4.5. You look at the Stutzman and Feather meal, you can see that the high and low nitrogen treatments received more and less respectively. The gypsum treatment was the only one that received gypsum. And then finally, it's important to note that all these were managed in the same way. They were all clean cultivated. When we look down at the floor management treatments, we've got a control, dust mulch, leaf mulch, and weedy treatment. And you can see that they all received the same number of amendments, but they differed in their floor management. The dust mulch treatment was tilled with the rototiller uh, to six to eight inches after rain events. The leaf mulch was covered with a four inch layer of leaf mulch after planting. And then the weedy treatment was not cultivated at all. And here are the results. So we'll start with the floor management treatments. Um, the first treatments that point out would be the dust mulch and the control, and they did the best of the different floor management treatments. You can see here in the figures, you got the plant size, and then you have this percent blossom and rot, and you can see 53% blossom and rot for the control, 56% for the dust mulch, the weedy 81%, and then the leaf mulch is 72%. So the dust mulch and the control did the best of the floor management treatments. They had the highest total and unblemished yield of all these treatments. They had the largest fruit of the four treatments. They had the lowest blossom end rot incidence of the four treatments. However, there were no differences between them, suggesting that dust mulching may not be necessary, at least for uh, dry farm tomato production. The leaf mulch appeared to help the plants conserve water, but there were significant problems with the crop. So the, the leaf mulch treatments, the soil water potential decreased the slowest of all the treatments. Those um, watermark sensors that we put in showed that these uh, plants were actually using water more slowly than the other treatments. Uh, this could be due perhaps to um, decreased evaporation from the surface due to the leaf mulch, 
or potentially uh, the leaf mulch could have been acting as a sponge. And there was uh, 2.24 inches of rain after the leaf mulch was applied. Um, so that may have saturated the mulch, and we did actually find roots growing in the mulch. However, the leaf mulch treatment um, had a lot of problems. The plants had lower unblemished yield, they had smaller fruit, and they had more blossom and rot uh, than the control. The weedy treatment performed the worst of all the treatments, not just all the floor management treatments, but all the treatments in the experiment. The plants were the most drought stressed of all the treatments, they had the lowest total and unblemished yield of all the treatments, they had smaller fruit than the control, and they had more blossom and rot than any other treatment. And we think this is because weeds compete with the crop for water and nutrients. So here is the data in a table. You can see our different treatments here. So start, we have total yield, pounds per plot. You can see that the dust mulch and the control have the highest total yield. The leaf mulch is a little lower, but it's not statistically different than the other two. You see these letters right here, A, 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 that uh, signifies um, you know, mean separation. And if the letters are different, that means that the differences in mean are statistically significant. But you can see that the weedy treatment um, was statistically lower than the others at 41.1 um, pounds per plot. On blemished yield, you can definitely see mean separation between the leaf mulch and then the dust in the control. That's because the leaf mulch had higher blossom and rot. Um, so you actually get the mean separation. The control in the dust had 57.6, 57.5. Leaf mulch is lower. And then the weedy treatment, 6.4 pounds of unblemished yield per plot. Number of fruit, you can see that these are basically the same. The weedy treatment is lower. Average fruit size, this is interesting. We've got the control and the dust mulch have bigger fruit. The weedy and the leaf mulch have smaller fruit. And then with blossom and rot incidents, you know, we've already talked about this, but you can see that the weedy and the leaf treatment had more blossom and rot than the dust in the control. So now let's turn our attention to the amendment treatments. First, interestingly, we found that increasing soil fertility resulted in increased blossom and rot. So the compost treatment, which had the highest soil nutrient concentration of nitrate, potassium, phosphorus, boron, had the most blossom and rot of the amendment treatments at 74% blossom and rot. If you look at the high, low, and control, which increases from 60 pounds of nitrogen per acre for low to 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre for the control to 160 for high nitrogen, you can see that blossom end rot increases 47% for low nitrogen, 53% for the control, and then 61% blossom end rot for the high nitrogen. And then finally, gypsum um, did not appear to reduce blossom end rot incidence. So we thought that maybe if blossom end rot is caused by calcium deficiency, we could solve that by applying gypsum and the gypsum actually had a little bit more blossom and rot than the control. So here is the data in a table. You can see that none of the plots differed really in total yield, so there's no mean separation. But when we look at unblemished yield, you can see that the compost treatment had the lowest unblemished yield, and that the low nitrogen treatment had the most unblemished yield. Number of fruit, again, no statistical differences, though the compost treatment had the most fruit. So for average fruit size, you can see that the low nitrogen and the control had larger fruit than the compost treatment. And then finally, with blossom and rot incidence, you can see the compost had the most blossom and rot, and then the low nitrogen had the least blossom and rot. If you take the nitrogen applied data and you look at it as a continuous variable, so the low nitrogen again had 40 pounds of nitrogen per acre, the control had 100 pounds of nitrogen per acre, and then the high nitrogen had 160 pounds of nitrogen per acre, you can see that it increases as the amount of nitrogen applied increases. And this is a statistically significant effect. When we looked at the, the, the treatments as discrete, you know, we're not seeing a statistically significant difference between, for example, low nitrogen and the high nitrogen. So you can see they both have the letter B there, but when you look at it as a continuous variable, we do see these differences. Um, and then this on the right is just those data broken up by block. So what are the big takeaways for you, the farmers? First, Definitely weed your farm. You know, weeding is probably the most important soil management treatment you can do for dry farm tomatoes to reduce blossom and rot and increase yields. And I would assume that that would hold true for other crops as well. The second takeaway is that for dry farm tomatoes at least, dust mulching to a depth of six inches does not appear to be necessary. You know, it didn't actually increase um, yields of marketable fruit. Um, you know, generally it is thought that dust mulching might help conserve soil moisture, but we did not see any evidence of that. Uh, it does not seem like it has any sort of measurable effect. And this is important because dust mulching can also potentially destroy soil structure and may lead to wind erosion. So it's important to maybe phase out 
this practice if it's not giving us any sort of you know, useful benefit. The leaf mulch may help retain soil moisture, but this trial suggests that it has a negative impact on dry farm tomato production. We definitely saw increased blossom end rot and lower unblemished yields and smaller fruit for the leaf mulch treatment. I think that the most likely reason for this is that the leaf mulch was increasing the nutrients available to the plant. Either the plants were getting nutrients from the leaf mulch or because there was reduced evaporation at the surface, the nutrients at the soil surface um, were available to the plants for longer and this would have increased their blossom and rot. The next big takeaway is don't over fertilize dry farm tomatoes. Too much fertility from compost or nitrogen fertilizers may result in increased blossom and rot. We don't know, you know how much fertilizer to apply and it probably depends on your soil, on its um, you know, chemical properties prior to fertilization and on its you know, physical properties like available water holding capacity. And then finally, gypsum addition did not reduce blossom and rot you know, one thing to, to note, though, is that we did apply the gypsum right before planting. So there is the possibility that it did not have time to really incorporate into the soil. And then finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that uh, early girl, you know, is very susceptible to blossom and rot. It gets about 50% blossom and rot uh, for exposed sites. We have identified um, blossom and rot resistant varieties of tomatoes. And Alex is about to talk about those. And uh, she would recommend that you grow those instead. And it's probably best maybe to do both, you know, to manage your soil, to minimize blossom and rot, and also, you know, choose the varieties that are the least likely to get blossom and rot. So for this year, our plan is actually to not plant any crops. Uh, we want to see how these treatments affect soil and moisture retention when no crops are grown. So maybe now we'll be able to see, you know, how much evaporation is actually happening, especially at the soil surface. So finally, do you have any questions? Feel free to enter questions in the chat box. Um, we have uh, about five minutes for questions before we move on to the tomato variety trial research update. Really, and really quickly too, before we get into questions, um, I'd also like to thank uh, Cassandra Waterman and Maricos Rhodes. They were two students who were not mentioned at the beginning, but, but they were involved. Uh, they, they didn't help with the harvest very much, but they, they did definitely help with planting, with uh, putting in the leaf mulch, um with weeding so yeah i i'm sorry to both of you that i left you out of that intro slide my bad they also put in those watermark sensors to depth if i remember that was like the big job oh yeah for sure so the first what is the big leafy condition plot condition in the overhead picture Big, oh, that would have been that would have been the uh, the weedy treatment. You know, you, when you looked at the picture at the beginning, uh, it looked like there was a lot of foliage. So that that was definitely uh, from weeds. Uh, hopefully, that answers your question, Eliza. Sorry, I'm getting some. I have these two monitors up. Some of them are directly to me. When were the amendments applied to the field? They were applied, um, you know, a couple weeks before planting. So definitely, they did not have a lot of time to. You know, we talk a bit about like the idea of these nutrients getting to the subsoil. Um, you know, I don't know how much of that. And they were all organic amendments too. So definitely um, there wasn't as much time maybe for mineralization of the nutrients to occur. Uh, hey, Matt, real quick, there was a question about varieties and uh, we're good. That's the exact next presentation coming up. So there'll, there'll be a lot more talk about varieties after this um, this Q&A session. So yeah, definitely not getting blossom end rot. Pete's saying that he doesn't get any blossom end rot. Um, you know, there are a lot of factors that relate to blossom end rot. Um, you know, variety is one of them uh, for sure. It definitely seems like things that, when I think about blossom end rot, I think that it's really, and this is, you know, me, don't, you know, this isn't like completely proven yet, but it definitely seems like, um, that the, and this is this is uh, from a paper I read uh, by an author named Saur, S-A-U-R-E. And he talked about how blossom end rot is really driven by uh, a sequence of events. You know, you start off with uh, luxurious early season growth and that luxurious growth predisposes the fruit to blossom end rot. You know, it basically changes the physiology of the fruit so that they have all of these uh, hormones that make them susceptible to blossom end rot and then that drought is actually what causes blossom and rot, some sort of stress. Um, so, you know, there could be uh, 
we've, we've definitely seen that shading and sheltering seems to reduce blossom and rot. Um, you know, that would reduce the stress. Weeding reduced blossom and rot, that reduces drought stress. Uh, so maybe there's some combination of factors on your site that are, uh, is leading you to low blossom and rot, um, you know. Uh, but, but it definitely seems from our research that, you know, on exposed sites, the site that, that was in that experiment has this strong wind coming in from the north. Um, and it seems like on those exposed sites, in our research, the average blossom and rot incidence is about 50% for early girl tomatoes. Um, and Alex will go into depth about all the different varieties that will, um, that have a lot less blossom and rot uh, on that same site, so. Um, Matt, there's a question about cover crops done prior to that planting. Yes. Yeah, it was a mix of three different species. Do you remember what they were? Yeah, it was a uh, triticale, Fetch. It's in the report. Uh, call, call I think it was two legumes. I think it was yeah. two legumes and, and and one grass or yeah, maybe fescue was in there. I think um, it was fescue was the was the third in that mix. I think you had the first two right. So, okay. so Angela, yeah, at that site there was a, 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 a three species mix. And then it was terminated, I think in April. 